Welcome back to the Binance Minipod series, where we summarize some of the latest pieces prepared by Binance Research. Binance Research is the market research and analysis arm of Binance. Find the latest reports and insights at research.binance.com. Hey guys, this is Leslie, and I'm really excited to talk about a new piece today about portfolio management. Why is this one so interesting? I think previously we've been quite focused on topics within the crypto asset class, but this one I think is the first one where we're writing something for a broader audience. So we really want to thank the uh, research team for that. Uh, please look for the report at research.binance.com. To step back and summarize, it's really a case to be made for people holding a lot of traditional asset classes, maybe uh, equities, bonds, FX, commodities, uh, gold, oil. It's a way to diversify your portfolio and to look at an asset class that moves differently. So to step back, this article basically mentions that Bitcoin has a low correlation, a high liquidity uh, versus some of the other asset classes. We run some simulated portfolios where we put Bitcoin as a, as a certain percentage of your total holdings and we uh, look at the differences in, uh, in the performance of your portfolio versus just holding traditional asset classes. In summary, we think it's something very interesting, especially with the development of the infrastructure nowadays, to be looking at this as a diversifier. So to go through the report, we first start with uh, just general metrics about Bitcoin. The first one we want to say is, and as we all know this, it is very, very high volatility. So the first table talks about equity drawdowns, which is basically the difference between uh, the max and the lowest moving forward in time. What that basically says is how much can you possibly lose? What's the maximum that you can lose if you were to happen to come in to buy uh, at the high? And the drawdown can be very large. I mean, in 2011, it's negative 86%. 2018, it's, it's negative 80%. So it's pretty clear to us that Bitcoin is a volatile asset class. But what's interesting is in uh, chart three, where we look at 90 days annualized vol, it's just a measure of uh, how volatile the asset is. What percentage does it move over a 90 day period in general? And you can see that since the Genesis block back in 2009, 2010, it really has dropped a lot compared to its early years. And uh, why do we think that? I think the main reason is the, the development of the market. There's a lot of different places to trade Bitcoin now, and there's generally it's much easier to trade larger sizes and to get liquidity, whether it's from OTC desks or from futures exchanges and from the, the great amount of spot exchanges out there around the world. The second topic we want to talk about, and I think this is the most interesting one, is a correlation with the other asset classes. So what we do is if you look at table two, we compare the correlation of Bitcoin versus some of the major indices in the world. So you can see we have the S&P, uh, the Russell 2000, so US equities, we have the Barclays uh, Aggregate Index, which looks at bonds. Uh, we also have uh, oil, gold, silver, commodities with topics, which is the Japanese Japanese index. Uh, we have the Hang Seng Index in Hong Kong, uh, the Euro stocks, and the FTSE. So basically a broad range of uh, indices that you would pull up on, say, Bloomberg, uh, both in equities, commodities, and in fixed income. And if you look at chart four and chart five, you can see that the correlation of Bitcoin versus the other asset classes is really quite low. So what you do is you look at the uh, column on the left and you see Bitcoin to Bitcoin correlation is one. But if you look at the other ones, S&P basically zero. You look at what are the higher ones uh, versus oil. Uh, CL1 is, is, the oil is the oil future and you see you know 0 0.12. And so in general, if, if you look at the SSXCs, which is the uh, Eurostox index, the correlation is uh, 0 0.22. You can see, generally speaking, it's much lower than the other asset classes. If you look at the other squares in the, in the triangle there, these are correlations against each other. And you see there's a lot more blues. What is interesting is that, yeah, the bond index is red. And that's relatively intuitive because uh, bond prices move higher when interest rates are lower. One thing is, is very interesting is you see what you can see is uh, for Bitcoin, it's almost the whole column is white, which means the correlation is very low. And uh, a lot of people like to do that. Uh, a lot of endowments, a lot of hedge funds to look for other asset classes which may not be correlated. You see some people go to farmland or they buy art pieces. They're always looking for an asset class that have generates returns but is uncorrelated with the other asset classes. So they're able to create an, an efficient frontier and uh, make their rec returns higher quality. The third thing to say about the Bitcoin asset class is it's very liquid. So if you look at chart six, you look at the exchange volumes, there's a lot of talk about what is the 
right way to measure exchange volumes, but I think what is clear that there is quite a lot of liquidity out there. So just purely looking at BitMEX, which people do seem to treat as a source of liquidity, the top 10 spot exchanges and the CME features, you add it all together, there's a lot of liquidity that trades on a day uh, in Bitcoin uh, across the world. We look at the spreads, uh, generally speaking, in table three, and uh, you can see that what we see here is uh, the bid offer, basically, and what volume you can trade on the exchange. And you can see here the bid offer on the left-hand side can be anywhere from one basis point. When we say basis point, this is actually equivalent to one hundredth of a percent. So the bid offer is one basis point here in BitMEX, five basis points on Kraken, two basis points on Binance, two basis points on Bitfinex, and you see the volumes that trade on a day. So if you really want to trade, you know, a million, even even ten million, the impact is actually not that large. And uh, why is this interesting? It makes it interesting for uh, the larger asset managers out there. So whether it's a high net worth individual or a retirement fund or another multi asset fund, it becomes more interesting if you're able to buy this in size. You know, for example, if you're looking at the Angola stamp market. Uh, it may be very low, lowly correlated with the other asset classes, but if you want to invest fifty million in the Angolan stem market, maybe it's a little harder than putting the fifty million dollars in Bitcoin. So that's why it's important to know that besides the low volatility, it is quite liquid and it's pretty easy to uh, put on size, as we would say, uh, in this market. Part two talks about portfolio management, and this is where we actually run some numbers. Uh, there's a lot of methodology in here, but what this basically says is we take two um, sort of portfolios that are representative of the market, and here we look at a, a BlackRock fund, uh, the iShares Multi-Asset Income ETF. It's roughly 60% bonds, 20% stocks, 20% alternative assets. Then we also look at the Vanguard VPGDX One Managed Payout Fund, and that's slightly higher So uh, in terms of stocks. So 55% stocks, 20% bonds, 25% alternative assets. And what we do here is, in conjunction with this ETF, we would put in, uh, say, a 1% allocation or a 5% allocation of Bitcoin. There's different ways of rebalancing. You can, every day, you make sure you're still at 1%. So with, if Bitcoin goes up, say, beginning 2019, you just keep selling. You keep selling to maintain your 1% uh, weighting. Or there's other ways where you dynamically hedge and you don't sell until it goes to 1.5% of your portfolio or when 5% goes to 75% of your, uh, 7.5% of your portfolio. There's different ways to do this, but basically what we do is we take these strategies where you're holding generally 1% or 5%, then we run some numbers to see you see how this performs versus just holding those, those ETFs uh, by yourself. And so you can see that tables uh, 5 and 7. I'll let you go into detail and look at the charts, but what I think is um, important here is to look at the four different metrics. So what is total return? What is annualized return? Annualized volatility and max drawdown. So just to summarize, total return is uh, during that time, 2016 to today, what is the total return of your portfolio? Annualized return, calculate it on a per year basis. Annualized volatility, once again, it's a measure of how volatile your portfolio is. In other words, how much does your price swing around? It's a general way that we use to, to measure funds and any other asset as well. Max drawdown, to step back and go back to what we said in the beginning, is sort of the maximum you will ever lose. So if you happen to be unlucky and you buy at the high and it drops to a very low level, then it comes back. The max drawdown is basically the high versus the lowest point thereafter. And so you can see here in the tables that generally speaking, uh, returns with Bitcoin, you know, when you put Bitcoin in the portfolio, they do go up, uh, but volatility also goes up as well. So there's ways to measure this. And I think going forward, we would look for our research team to have more metrics about measuring risk versus return. But what's important to note is, yes, total return goes up by quite a large amount. If you see here, if you compare the BlackRock multi-asset income ETF with a 5% Bitcoin holding, you'd have a total return of 59% if you hold from 2016 to today. Whereas if you just hold the multi-asset fund, you would be making 27.8%. So that's quite a big jump, especially when you're only holding 5% of your portfolio in Bitcoin. But of course, naturally, the volatility goes up too. So you see the volatility goes from 5.6% to 6.69. Now, frankly speaking, if you're going to double your returns to have an annualized volatility of just 1% higher, to me, sounds like sounds like a good deal. This does make the argument that adding Bitcoin to your portfolio, at least for the last five years, in the past has been good for overall portfolio perspective.
And one thing to say is, you know, back in 2016, Bitcoin was a lot less developed than it is today, right? I mean, would you put 5% of your net worth into Bitcoin back in 2016? You know, between 2016 and 2018 is when really most of the a large part of the appreciation happens. So, I mean, we know there are, there are reasons why this analysis looks good, but it's at least good to look at historical numbers and to see how potentially interesting it is to put uh, Bitcoin into your portfolio. Finally, I think we talk about the, the conclusion. Is this interesting for asset managers? For example, if I run a pension fund or if I run a large pool of money, say in, in, whether it's insurance or, or a wealth fund, uh, there's a few things I talk about. I want to look at diversifying into different asset classes such that, you know, if the correlation is high in a bad market, everything tends to zero. Your money feels less safe because the value of your portfolio is just swinging around. So you want to find things with, with low correlation. But on the other hand, if you're an insurance fund or if you're a sovereign wealth fund or, you know, if you're managing your own finances and you're a high net worth individual, you want something that has liquidity as well. You say you're a wealth fund with 500 billion of assets and you want to put 1% into Bitcoin, that's 5 billion, right? I mean, to, that's quite a large size. One thing that does come into mind is, is how liquid is, is the asset class. And finally, when it comes to sourcing liquidity, there are many, many ways now. We did mention futures contracts and OTC desks. We will make a plug for the uh, Binance Trading Desk. That's something that we've been here and we're relying on using our network, our broad network of investors all around the world to source liquidity and provide liquidity for clients. So you can always come to us. Uh, if you search for uh, Binance OTC Trading, you'll find our websites and our blogs uh, as to what we offer. Thanks for checking with us and uh, hopefully I'll be back soon on uh, more portfolio management pieces. Thank you very much.